Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by your favorite speaker, Dr. Ronald J. Brown. Our topic for today is, as usual, an exciting topic, and this is the future of the USA. What kind of challenges is the United States of America <clears throat> confronting in the 21st century? Well, this is called futuristics. It's future looking. What is going to be in my years that remain and in your years that remain? What kind of future are our children, our grandchildren, our students, our friends going to inherit as we plunge into the 21st century? Well, I have outlined <clears throat> several topics which we will discuss in turn. First is, of course, global warming. Top in the news. The rise of China. As I speak, Joseph Biden is over in uh, Asia meeting with Prime Minister Xi of China, trying to chart a peaceful path to the rise of a new superpower. The economic decline, the big debate, is the United States in economic decline? Unemployment seems to be being reduced, but yet inflation is here. What is going to be the future of the United States economically? Are we in decline or are we going to have a glorious future? Point four, the rise of new world powers. We're not alone anymore. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in the late eight, 1980s, we had a very brief period where the United States was the hyperpower, as the French like to call it. But today, we have China, we have India, we have the countries of like Brazil, Indonesia, which are emerging as major rivals to the United States. Number five, holy wars. Religion has emerged as a major determinant in our future. Six, refugees. As I speak, thousands of refugees are swarming across the border, it seems, every hour from South America. To say nothing of the refugee crises in Europe. Seven, pandemics. Well, it seems like COVID-19 is over, and I got my two monkeypox vaccinations. But as we go into another winter, as I speak, who knows what is going to happen? Point eight is the perceived moral decline, the issues of abortion, drugs, sexual liberation. A lot of people view this as liberalism, getting freedom to be yourselves, whereas other people view it as the moral decline of the United States and demand that measures be taken to reinforce the United States as a moral country. And then finally, the big debate, what is going to be the future of the United States as we confront all of these challenges? So let's get going on our exploration of the United States in the 21st century. <clears throat> Well, it seems every year the fires in California get worse. The dams which used to bring water to the Pacific Southwest are drying up. The rivers are going dry. And California and the other states in the West and the Southwest are burning. <clears throat> well, that nobody can debate. There is a drought in the Southwest. No rain, no snow in the mountains, and the state is constantly battling forest fires. Well, whether this is caused by just a natural cycle, gone through ice ages before, and now we're in a heat wave. So 
don't get upset. Whereas other people argue that it is a, in a process which is being accelerated by human industries, pollution from gas-powered cars and factories, burning of coal. In fact, the North and South Poles are melting at an increased rate, which is going to lead to the rising sea levels and ever worse storms. <clears throat> Hurricanes barreling in from Africa across the Atlantic. The waters are getting warmer. The hurricanes absorb more water. And it seems like every week there's a hurricane devastating Puerto Rico, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Jamaica, sometimes hitting Mexico, sometimes hitting California, sometimes hitting Florida and the Gulf Coast. They seem to be getting worse. In fact, they're increasing the intensity of these hurricanes, and they're having to invent new terms to measure how much water is in these hurricanes as they hit the coast. Well, of course, hurricanes bring fresh water because it is water that is evaporated from the Atlantic Ocean, but if they hit the coast at high tide, they're forcing water from the ocean to sweep onto the coastal cities. Here we see a picture of um, Florida, of Miami, underwater. Well, the salt water coming in from the ocean destroys the plants, soaks the earth with salt water, causing electrical systems to degenerate the foundations of buildings saturated with salt water and chemicals uh, causing even worse devastation. So clearly climate change is happening. Hurricane Sandy of October in 2012 uh, devastated huge areas of New York City, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan. In fact, when I go to Long Island, very often on the South Shore, I'll see houses being raised, as you can see in the picture. Well, the government finances a large part of this um, raising of houses, uh, but it still costs a fortune. I have friends who had a house like this and it was damaged, and so, after the hurricane, they raised it. Well, the people were not getting any younger. And then they realized that their garage hanging in the air was absolutely worthless. And they were no longer able to climb the steps to go up to the front door. So they had to sell the house. So side effect of hurricanes and global warming that we don't think about, but we're going to have to start taking seriously. Drought, not only in Africa, but Mexico is drying out. California, Pacific Northwest with no rain, the plants, the corn, the uh, fruit trees are no longer able to get enough water to keep them alive. Well, how is this going to affect the food supply? We're having famine in Africa. Crisis in Mexico and Central America. Well, of course, this leads to a rise in refugees fleeing either the hurricane-ravaged islands of the Caribbean or the drought-stricken areas of South America, Central America, the Caribbean islands. And in Africa, it is even worse. As the Sahara Desert grows, more and more refugees are finding their way across the Atlantic to Mexico and lining up at the border with Texas, fleeing a storm-ravaged environment, a drought-stricken environment. And humans are contributing to this. Use of coal and oil in factories polluting the air. 
garbage piling up, saturating the earth, plastics floating in the ocean by the tons, storm water going into the, into the rivers, again, polluting the rivers and killing the animals. Clearly, something has to be done. Is the United States doing enough? Well, you have too many people involved in climate denial, saying that it has nothing to do with humans. All the gas fumes from our cars and factories and garbage flown into the rivers have absolutely no effect on climate change. And so there's a literal battle going on between those who believe that humans should do something to stop the pollution, and they believe that this is causing an acceleration of global warming. And those who say, don't worry, it's a natural cycle. It'll get warm for a while, then it'll get cold for a while. But here again, this is one of the most important debates confronting the United States as we move further into the 21st century. Another major problem facing the United States is the rise of China. Well, as Martin Jack wrote in his book, When China Rules the World, China views itself as the middle kingdom, the center of the earth. And of course, Beijing is in the center of China and in the center of the earth. Like the United States, it believes that its society is unique. It has a unique destiny in human affairs. So the Chinese are starting to say to the Americans, you are not the only superpower. You do not have the right to determine the future. We, with a billion and a half people, growing industry and Navy that is now larger than the American Navy, the Chinese say we have a role to play in determining the future. And the Chinese view Beijing is the center of the world with concentric circles. As you can see from the map on the right, Beijing is in the center and circles going around it. Chinese circle, Han Chinese circle, Asian circle, civilized people circle, with the United States considered a barbarian country on the outer ring. So China strong, firmly believes that it will have a say, if not the say, in determining the future. The Chinese have a unique way of viewing history, and it traces itself back to Confucianism, the great philosopher, teacher of ancient China. In Confucius's thinking, there is no heaven and hell. There are no gods. What we have on this earth is what we got. This lifetime that we have is the only one we have. So it is the duty of Confucianists not to suffer in this world and then hope that you'll be happy in heaven when you die. Confucius said, there is no heaven, there is no hell. It is your duty to build a perfect society. Heaven on earth here in this world. So that explains why the Chinese are so hardworking. Students going to school, getting excellent grades, taking over the best schools in the United States. Well, luckily, we have affirmative action. So if you go to a school like this Peter Stuyvesant High School in New York, you know, 80% of the students are Asians, but they reserve a seat for a Jew in one corner, a Black in one corner, maybe a Hispanic somewhere, and a nice Irish Christian somewhere, uh, just to be nice to these inferior peoples. But of course, it is the Chinese who are taking over Harvard to get a few non-Asians in 
through affirmative action, they basically have to make a major effort to find a Jew or a white Christian or an African-American or a Hispanic that can compete with these aggressive, hardworking Chinese. Because the goal of Confucianism is to build heaven on earth. Don't wait until you're dead for heaven. Build your heaven on earth. And that's where we see the modern cities going up. Apartment blocks, factories, trade, military. They are building their heaven here on earth. Their grand strategy through the Belt and Road Initiative, linking China with Europe, the Middle East, North Africa, through highways, through railroads, and through shipping lines. The Chinese are replacing the United States as the major trading partner. I think there's only one country in South America which still has the United States as its main trading partner, and that is Colombia. All the other countries, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Chile, their bulk of their trade is now with China. Even the GDP, the average income of, an, of a person, has now, as of 2019, been equal. And the standard of living in China has now surpassed that of the United States. So clearly, China, with a billion and a half people, is taking over the economy of the world and education of the world. So China is clearly the country of the future. <clears throat> Loads of books are being written about this, the rise of China, how economic reform is creating a new superpower. China developing intercultural communicative competence through visual images, here again, the China Institute educational programs basically warning the world the American century is over. China is now the superpower of the world. For many Americans, this is a scary vision of the future. But as I always tell my students, uh, if I was in my early 20s again, I would be studying Chinese and be on the first boat to be part of the rising superpower. And this is not unusual. Think of all the millions of immigrants who came to the United States in the late 1800s. Why did they come to the United States? Well, they were escaping probably persecution, but they saw more economic advantage in the rising superpower than they did of the superpowers of the past, like Germany, like England or France or Holland. They saw the future in America and wanted to be part of it. And so millions of young people are migrating to China going there to get an education and be part of the country of the future. Well, the rise of China is paralleled, in the opinion of many people, with the decline of the United States. Noam Chomsky, a great professor at MIT, wrote Requiem for the American Dream. Requiem is the song you sing at a funeral, arguing the United States is declining. Look on the left, the rise and the fall of American growth. At this point, we are holding our own while countries like China are rushing forward. Nickel and dimed on not getting by in America. The economic situation is deteriorating. I always tell my students, 
give me another 10 or 20 years of a decent life in America, and then I'll be ready to drop dead. But for younger people, as they look into the future, they are alarmed. The American middle class is in rapid decline, meaning there are more and more people who are super rich and more and more people who are poor and fewer and fewer people in the middle. Americans always thought of ourselves as a middle class country. Think of the pictures of the American century, big cars, highways, vacations, airlines, supermarkets filled with everything you could possibly want. Whereas today, more and more people are living on the street unemployed. More and more people are living without health care. The economic situation of the middle class is rapidly deteriorating. <clears throat> Well, what is causing this? Well, outsourcing. So that when I plan my next trip to Mexico and go on the phone to check something, they tell me, well, um, you can make the changes, blah, blah, blah. And then I always say, well, where are you? And if the woman on the telephone or the guy will say, oh, I'm in Bangladesh or I'm in India. Why? Because it's cheaper to build a building in India hire a bunch of Indians who speak decent English and have them do the work which previously was done in the United States. So, uh, everything we use, where, very often what we eat is made in Vietnam, hecho a Mexico, made in China, clothing made in Bangladesh. These are the jobs going to other countries which at one time were jobs that made the American middle class. And not just outsourcing, but you also have robotics, where you go to a factory that makes cars, there are fewer and fewer people working and more and more robots. Indian call centers, where the Indians are gradually getting educated, they're getting good skills, they know computers, and you're starting to have your Indian multi-millionaires. Famous bestseller, Slumdog Millionaire. Once again, talking about the rising middle class in India and most other countries of the world, and the declining middle class in the United States. Here we see the robotics, where fewer and fewer humans are working, and it is being done by robots. Whether they're robots that look like people delivering packages, or whether it's a robot as in the bottom on the right, where it is simply a machine. And a machine does not have to take a break and go to the bathroom. It doesn't have a dinner break for an hour. It doesn't shut down on Sunday. It can work all day Christmas, producing cars, computers, everything we could possibly need. And they don't retire. We don't have to have accident insurance. They are replacing the actual human being. Even in education, those wonderful days when I am here speaking to you, pretty soon it will be a robot teaching the class. Or even when I record a Zoom conference, I record it once and it is on YouTube, the students log on and I can just stay at home and go to sleep. So teachers like me are being paid less and less. Most of the teachers in colleges these days don't get insurance, don't get Social Security or TIA, CREF, and even teaching is no longer a well-paid job. And those teachers who still have a full-time job like me 
are becoming fewer and fewer as technology replaces the human being. Health care is becoming more and more a technological job. I went to a doctor recently, a dermatologist, and I had some spots on my body and they just had a nurse who came in with an ultra sophisticated camera, analyzed them and said, you're fine, nothing to worry about. So where was the doctor? He was no longer there. It was a robot which was taking over. So here again, people are losing jobs. They either become a multi-billionaire or they end up living on the street and collecting Coke cans for five cents each. Well, if those problems are not enough to make you wonder what is gonna be the future of the USA, well, new countries are arising. We talked about the challenge coming from China with its billion and a half people, its Navy bigger than the American, taking over global trade, which used to be dominated by the United States. But China is not the only country telling the United States, move over, we are joining the big league. The so-called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. When you look at the map, you see China, India, or about a third of all the humans on the face of the earth, approximately a billion and a half in each country. So the 400 million in the United States is a drop in the bucket. You add other countries such as South Africa, Russia, Brazil, they are moving up the food chain. Their middle class is growing. They are industrializing. They are building universities and they are going to become major rivals to the United States. So how is the United States going to respond to this? Are we gonna go and start dropping atomic bombs on China to keep American world domination? We're on good terms with India and Brazil and South Africa these days, but who knows what's going to be in the future. Brazil on the rise. I was not too long ago in Brazil for a month, traveling all over and was impressed by the country. That doesn't mean they have a lot, don't have a lot of problems. The favelas, the slums on the hillsides surrounding the major Brazilian cities are atrocious. But yet the cities and the country is on a rise. On the right, you see the middle class population is rising rapidly in every place except the United States. So the BRICS are now gaining huge purchasing power. And uh, while they have their multi-billionaires and while they have their people in abject poverty, more and more people are becoming upward bound, middle class. They want a car, they want a nice apartment, they want air conditioning in the summer, they want nice clothes, they want a vacation at the beach with the family for a week or two during the hot season. So these are the countries which are once again telling the United States, get out of the way, we are moving forward. Europe is uniting. Just recently, the European Union expanded to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechoslovaks, Hungarians, Romanians, and Bulgarians who were part of the Soviet empire and now are part of Europe. The Euro is an expanding currency. I was in Turkey not too long ago, 
and I wanted to pay for my hotel room in American dollars. You always get a big discount if you pay in dollars. And they said, oh, we don't accept American dollars. We want the euro. Fly into, when I fly into Paris, spend some time with my friends, and I can just jump on a bus and go up to Belgium or Germany. There are no borders anymore. Young people from Spain can go to Germany and work for the summer. They don't need any papers. They're paid in the euro, which is just as good uh, in their country as it is in Germany. So Europe, as a united entity, is now almost equal in size and population to the major United States and China. In fact, many people say that Europe is the third world power. Hmm. So the population is expanding. Economies, economies are expanding. And the United States is in the eyes of many people being left behind economic. Population growth, European Union, half a billion people. The United States, some people say 350 million. Brazil, over 200 million. 1.4 billion in China, 1.3 billion in India, although many people say that China will, or India will overtake China if it hasn't already. So what we are seeing is a change in population. The largest growing area in the world is Africa, which in the near future will probably have more people than India and China combined. Well, this is also a problem because as we are going to see, as drought and revolutions and wars plague Africa, millions of these Africans are becoming refugees and trying to get into Europe, the United States. So population growth favors Africa. Well, another major crisis facing the United States is the rise of holy wars. Well, wars have been part of American history since the American Revolution, if not even before that, the wars against the Indians and the French to take over the Mississippi Valley. But the United States has firmly believed and established a separation of church and state separation of religion from politics. So our wars have not been wars of religion like you have in so many other countries of the world. The Vietnam War was to keep South Vietnam as an American colony so we could exploit it economically. The Iraq War was to overthrow Saddam Hussein and let the American industries move in and take over the country. The war in Afghanistan was to overthrow those people who had caused the destruction of the World Trade Center. The Cold War was a rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. It was not about religion. It was about who was going to dominate the world. Well, today we are involved in the war in Ukraine, where Russia is expanding, saying that Ukraine is not a real country, that the Russian population of Ukraine, which is about 25%, should be part of Russia and not be part of a foreign country named Ukraine. But as we move into the 21st century, Wars are more and more about religion and less and less about economics. Samuel P. Huntington, in his famous book, The Clash of Civilizations, said that the future is going to be a war between 
civilization. These are religion-based civilizations. United States and Canada and North America and Europe are Catholic and Protestant countries. They are of a strong bond of NATO, strong bond of economic ties, and even the majority of the Americans and Canadians were immigrants from Europe. Well, Russia is part of the Orthodox civilization, according to Huntington. That's why it is taking over the Ukraine, saying they are also Orthodox Christians. They're not Catholics and Protestants. The Muslim world, from Morocco down to Senegal, over to Sudan, up to Pakistan and Central Asia and Turkey, as well as Indonesia and Malaysia, are part of an Islamic world. They're rejecting Western-style life. They want to have Islamic law in their countries. Well, Huntington says that China is what he calls a cynic civilization, Confucian. India is Hindu. And he argues that these civilizations are going to be at war in the future arguing that the United States should remain a Catholic and Protestant country. Get rid of Jews, get rid of Muslims, get rid of Buddhists and Hindus, saying that, that would only, they would only weaken the United States. Europe is being flooded with migrants from North Africa and the Middle East who are Muslims, causing the French government to swing to the extreme right to make France Catholic again. So religion is re-emerging as a major issue in the 21st century. In Israel, Palestine, Jews and Muslims are bitterly at war with Israel ethnic cleansing in East Jerusalem, West Bank settlement, and now the new prime minister, um, Netanyahu, wants to start expelling the Christian and Muslim in, um, populations, make Israel Jewish. In Myanmar, the old Burma, expelling the Muslims. In India, Hindus and Muslims are literally at war under the new BJP ultra-right-wing Hindu government. Islamic countries are notorious for persecuting Jews and Christians and Hindus and non-Muslims, where they want to establish Muslim uh, Egypt, Muslim Syria, Muslim Turkey, and get rid of religious minorities. In Israel, Bibi has just come back to power, believing in greater Israel, expanding and reducing Christian and Muslim population. Russia, Putin has returned to the Orthodox Church, and has made that an instrument of his foreign policy. ISIS, rise of Islamic states, the Islamic Republic of Iran, even in Brazil, Bolsonaro, in, in the book Beef, Bible, and Bullets, is going to make Brazil a evangelical Christian country. So, Religious struggles, religious strife, religious warfare is, according to Samuel B. Happy Huntington, going to be a permanent fixture of the 21st century. Even in the United States, with the administration of Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Trump, and possibly a return to Trump in 24, 
making America Christian again. One nation under God, and it's not a generic God for the evangelical Christians. It is one nation under Jesus. When they say one nation under God, you see the cross. It's not the Jewish God or the Hindu God or the Jewish God. And so the evangelicals are dragging the United States into this series of religious wars, which are going to be a major fixture of the 21st century. Refugees, a major crisis, not just for the United States, but around the world. We see the graph in the middle, showing in the 60s and 70s, very few immigrants were coming and now soaring into the future, a rate we had never seen before. Well, as long as the immigrants were nice white Christians coming from Europe, well, that was okay. But the new immigrants flooding into the United States are South Americans. They are Africans, people from the Middle East, Chinese, Indians. These are the new people coming in. And many people argue that they will not go easily into the American melting pot as the Germans, the Irish, the English, the Scottish, the Poles, and the Italians did. But they are going to overwhelm Christian America and turn it into a country that might be Muslim or Jewish or Hindu. They are destroying what America traditionally was. And so the flood of refugees is a very real problem. And many people view the arrival of millions of refugees as a threat to the United States. Donald Trump made a big deal of building the wall to keep out the millions of Mexicans, Central Americans, people from the Caribbean islands who are trying to get into the United States. Good fences make good neighbors. Well, in Donald Trump's case, good walls make good neighbors. And many of these refugees on the border in Texas are not just from South and Central America, but many Africans have made their way across the Atlantic on cheap flights and then are also standing on the border to come into the United States. Well, a lot of this is racist. We don't want to become a brown country in the United States, even though that's my name, but skin color should remain white. And so excluding Asians, Middle Easterners, Africans, and dark-skinned South Americans. This remains a major problem. Donald Trump highlighted it with his wall, but it is now still a major issue. Donald Trump tried to ban Muslims, had nothing good to say about Asians, and still millions of refugees flooded in. Just recently from Florida, DeSantis put a whole plane load of refugees uh, and sent them to Martha's Vineyard, a deluxe neighborhood off the coast of Massachusetts, saying, well, you in the North who love refugees so much, you can have as many as you want. Well, refugees are considered by the evangelical Christians as a threat to Christian America. We don't want Buddhists and Hindus and Jews and Muslims and non-Christians. And so in many of the ultra right-wing evangelical Christian um, press, you see baseball hats make America Christian again. 
Well, these refugees come for various reasons. You have the climate refugees, flooding and drought in Mexico and Central America, hurricanes in the Caribbean, global warming in Africa, leading entire countries to virtually disappear. Political refugees fleeing political oppression in many of the dictatorships of the world. Economic refugees and migrants. Here again, young people who see no future in their countries of Central America or the Caribbean and figure if they get to America, they'll learn English quickly, they'll get a job and they too will become successful. Religious refugees fleeing religious persecution in India, the, in Burma, the, the Muslims, in China with the Uyghurs, in Israel with the uh, problems with the Christians and the Muslims. The civil war in Syria, causing millions of people to flee, as in the civil war in Sudan and the ongoing wars in the Sahel in Africa. There's no lack of refugees. There's no lack of reasons for these people to flee their country and to try to make their way to the United States or to Europe. Another problem which is gonna face the United States is the next pandemic. Well, we have been dealing with pandemics in the United States for quite some time, going back to the pan uh, pandemic of polio, smallpox, tuberculosis, pneumonia, dengue fever, Zika, AIDS, Ebola. They don't have monkeypox on the list, but that's the recent one. Now I got my two monkeypox shots. Well, I'm ready for the next pandemic. But the question is, is the United States going to be ready for it? The recent horrendous experience of COVID-19, where over a million Americans perished. And this is with one of the best healthcare systems in the world, but yet we had the highest reported mortality rate. Actually, nobody knows how many people died in Africa or India or Brazil or even Mexico because the healthcare systems in many of these countries are available only to the well-to-do. You were in Africa and you, someone died in your family. Well, you'd bury them in the village cemetery and the, the Muslim imam or the Christian priest or the African uh, um, herbal doctor would say a few words. They were buried and that was the end. And so when I say the United States had the highest reported death rate, that means we know who died. But even the United States, many people say there were twice as many who died from COVID, but the death was not recorded as a death from COVID. It was reported a heart attack or one other disease which existed at the same time as the person had COVID. So the question is, are we going to be ready for the next pandemic? Well, if you watch movies on TV or go to the theaters, you will see that Hollywood and many writers are not convinced that the United States will be ready. Movies like Carriers, Pandemic, World War Z, these paint a very bleak, picture of the United States, where we were able to gradually develop vaccines for COVID and monkeypox, but at great cost. And of course, they were rationed. I was lucky I got my first monkeypox um, vaccine at the beginning 
But after that, within a couple of days, they it was almost impossible to get the uh, vaccine. And I had to wait months before I was able to find a place that was um, distributing the second monkeypox. And of course, this becomes a political and religious issue. How many people refuse to wear masks saying my individual freedom to kill myself and other people outweighs your need for some type of protection. So will we be ready for the next pandemic? Well, million dollar question. AIDS, Ebola, opioid epidemic sweeping the United States. Once again, government are as unable to do anything. And another pandemic that we don't know, talk too much about, and these are the diseases that are becoming antibiotic resistant. There are forms of gonorrhea and syphilis and tuberculosis that penicillin can no longer cure that you linger in a hospital in isolation until you die because there is no effective antibiotic against so many of the diseases. With the COVID, we learned how quickly a germ can mutate. And from week to week, a whole new form of COVID-19 suddenly emerges and sweeps the country and sweeps the world. And scientists and politicians work to try to develop a new vaccine, but who knows how long that will be available or will be um, effective against the next virus. Hundreds of movies are coming out warning people, The Stand, Quarantine, Carriers, 12 Monkeys, Outbreak, Containment, even the History Channel, very famous Andromeda, Andromeda Strain uh, by Michael Creighton. I mean, uh, clearly question, are we going to be ready? Well, I'm ready. I mean, I teach on Zoom, I lecture on Zoom, and I have enough canned food in my apartment to last me a year. So if something does happen, I can wall myself in my apartment and I'll be okay. The only thing I don't have is enough wine to deal with a year in lockdown. So I'm going to have to work on that. The eighth major crisis facing the United States in the 21st century is what many people perceive as the moral decline of the United States. Traditionally, a strong family with a mother and the father and happy kids was the basis of a society. Whereas in the United States, many people argue that the decline of the American family is leading to the overall moral decline. As I speak, there's a major debate going on on abortion. Should a woman be allowed to kill her own baby? And if yes, up to what age? So that killing babies is what we call abortion is actually killing a baby. It is just a question of up till what age are you allowed to kill the baby? So this is the most recent moral issue that Republicans and Democrats and many other people are arguing about. Books declaring the decline of the United States, not just because of abortion, but for example, the book by David Carlin, The Decline and Fall of the Catholic Church. Many people say fewer and fewer people are identifying with the major religions. Fewer and fewer people, fewer people go to churches or synagogues or mosques. 
traditional values are in decline. The book on the right by Todd Starnes, God Less America, real stories from the front lines of the attack on traditional values. Sexual immorality, gay marriage, single mothers with a gang of kids and no husband or fathers in sight, prostitution, marriage and divorce, abortion, are all viewed by many people as a sign that American society is declining. It's an unhealthy society. Big issue in these days is teaching sex education in the schools. Should you have gays and lesbians in public teaching in schools, gay marriage in churches? These are all major moral issues that are literally tearing the United States apart. Art. Drugs, alcohol, crime. Here again, you see the battle going on. Should drugs be legalized and which ones should be legalized? Crime for people needing money to buy drugs. Drugs coming across the border from Mexico and being smuggled in, leading to more and more arrests, imprisonments, drug addictions, and deaths. Here again, this is a major issue that the United States is grappling to deal with. How can we recreate a good, healthy society? Just walking around the streets of Queens, you see people laying on the streets, strung out on drugs, you have to be careful walking down certain areas because you see needles laying on the streets and little kids see it and looks pretty. They try to pick it up and they could kill themselves. Many people accuse the United States of being more interested in money and material success than they are in any type of moral well-being. Books like How to Become a Millionaire. Donald Trump would do anything for a dollar. Bernie Madoff, the man who stole 65 billion, and lots of it was taken from elderly people. Jewish retirees, who he spoke up in the Jewish uh, areas of Florida and New York, getting them to invest their life savings in his schemes and ended up ruining their lives. His own son committed suicide. In fact, here in New York, I know people who were related to Bernie Madoff and they ended up changing their names. The greed and the immorality of Donald Trump, once again, making the phrase on our dollar in God we trust as sort of a joke. Well, many people interpret this moral decline as a sign that not just the United States is going to collapse, but the end of the world is approaching. Diseases, pandemics, wars, hurricanes, moral decline are all signs of the end times, which will lead to a destruction of the earth, the major wars. And then Christians believe only Jesus, the Messiah, will be able to save the world from total annihilation. Once again, uh, movies like After the Fall portray the destruction of the United States. The American apocalypse is ending. And this was brought out recently when the Trump supporters, the Nazis, the Southern Confederates and terrorist groups tried to overthrow the government in Washington, storm the Capitol, lynch Pence, 
and uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi and reinstate Donald Trump as King Donald the First of Christian America. So how you interpret what these people say is a moral decline uh, depends on your perspective. Either it is a sign of the end time or they are challenges that good people in America should try to deal with. Solve homelessness, solve poverty, take care of children who are stuck in with a single mother in poverty and no family structure. This is again a problem that is going to plague the United States into the 21st century, and according to many people, will destroy the country. So as the United States moves further and further into the 21st century, is this American optimism? That America is a shining city on a hill to be an example to the world. Our belief in manifest destiny, spread the American way of life, American democracy and freedom, not just from the Atlantic to the Pacific, but around the world. Think of the idealism when George W. Bush invaded Iraq and overthrew Saddam Hussein. He had a vision of a democratic, free Iraq. And what was the result? Waterboarding torture, rape, mass murder, a whole crop of American war criminals who are still walking the streets of America with no punishment whatsoever. Well, what is going to be the future of the United States? Can we restore the vision of manifest destiny, optimism, and the shining city on a hilltop can we make America great again? Even the term, I mean, it's not, a, for most people, it's not a negative term. It is, we do what we have to to make America great again. Many people argue that the decline of America is a myth that America can be made great again. Barack Obama's book, The Audacity of Hope, Hope for the future. Be optimistic. Be brave. We will confront these horrendous problems facing the United States, and America will emerge stronger and better for it. Well, the decline of America, is it a myth? Well, Time Magazine, you read it one way, it says, yes, America is in decline. Switch it around and no, America is still number one. Who knows what is going to be the solution to all this? Who knows what the future is going to bring? But as I said earlier, <clears throat> give me another 20 years of a strong dollar and a reasonably safe New York City and I'll be happy. But it is the next generation that is either going to have to pick up the pieces of a destroyed United States or build a better America. Here again, this is the question facing the United States. Well, it's not only a question facing the United States, but as Michio Kaku says in his book, the future of humanity is at stake. What is going to be our future? Are we going to so pollute the planet that we'll have to move to spaceships in space or other planets? Or can we salvage humanity and our Earth? Well, we shall see. At any rate, thank you very much for joining me. This is uh, Dr. Ronald Brown logging off. I hope to see you sometime in the near future for another exciting lecture. So thank you for joining me, and I will see you in the future.